Welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. My name is Joy Rios and I am the show's host. And we are very fortunate today for many reasons, but one thing we talk about and I like to set up is how complicated the healthcare system can be. And so each one of our guests brings um, a piece of that puzzle and their expertise to our listeners and audience. And today I am very fortunate to have Natalie Davis, the CEO of the United States of Care. Natalie, can you please take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure, and thank you so much for having me, a big fan of the podcast. Um, I'm, like you said, I'm Natalie Davis. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the United States of Care. We are a five-year-old organization that is working to make the healthcare system work better and work better for people. We know the healthcare system is not working. We know that the way we are fixing it is not working. And we believe that's because uh, we are not spending the time talking to people across this country to understand what they want out of this healthcare system. That's what we do. We have spent years talking to thousands and thousands of people in every state to understand across demographics, what do people want in this healthcare system? And we know that they want targeted common sense solutions to make sure that they have the certainty they can afford their healthcare that they have dependable coverage as life changes, that they have personalized care when and how they need it. And number four, they have a healthcare system that's easy to understand and navigate. That is our North Star. It is what we work on every day, whether that's running state campaigns, federal campaigns, we have a policy innovation lab where we build new policy uh, and really are part of changing the narrative to say, look, there are places people agree on we need change. They would help their pockets. They would help their health they would help their family. And, and we need to make sure that we're building that healthcare system for people. So you have a history of working with um, the government, correct? And you were part of the Obama administration working for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Can you talk a little bit about how that has informed wh where you are now and what you bring to the table? Yeah, absolutely. You know, coming to Washington, D.C., I actually ended up here because I thought I was going to be a museum curator. I fell in love with art, uh, but really art as an expression of our society and as the individual. And I got to D.C. and people said, that's really hard. People come across the world to do that. Good luck. And I was like, oh, well then I'll just give up on that dream. Uh, and I met some uh, a headhunter who said, you know, what you're interested in, anorexia, bulimia, food deserts, depression, um, those are part of our healthcare system. So go into healthcare. Uh, and, you know, I started doing that and, and really love, of course, the topic because it's so important to people and was asked to join the Obama administration after the Affordable Care Act passed. And we were standing up so many parts of the, where I work specifically, the marketplace, healthcare.gov. And you know, I thought I was going to be a policy wonk, but turned out I was surrounded by brilliant policy wonks. But what I loved was turning their thinking and their direction and putting that into operations, into team, into culture, and really understanding, are we building something that people can use out in this country? And healthcare.gov didn't work the first time. And so it was a real lesson in without good implementation, um, you don't have good policy. And that really has shaped so much of the work that I do at United States of overall and at United States of Care. And then working directly with the administrator, Andy Slavitt, when he ran CMS, it was the highlight of my career at that time was setting up our listening tour. We went across the country and talked to entrepreneurs, advocates, patients, governors, reporters, um, anyone really who touches the healthcare system and said, how is it working? How is it going? Um, we had asks of them to make sure they were doing better by the beneficiaries, but also bringing that back and bringing that back to make better policy. And so that's where I started really 
honing my skills at listening and using that to build responsive policy. So you'll see that in our work at United States of Care, everything is built on listening. It is built on going out and talking to experts, finding you know what's working, what's not. There may be disagreements, of course, on how to fix things, but really making sure that that we're bringing the the best that the healthcare system change makers have to bear and and building that healthcare system that works for people. I really love the concept just of taking the time to listen. I feel like a lot of organizations take an opposite approach or it's like, listen to me. And so I'm curious about how that is incorporated into the policies that you've seen. Is there any, are there any examples of like results that are based from the listening tour you all went on? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I did my first part of the listening tour when we kicked it off. I sat at a kitchen table in San Diego with um, a woman who uh, we asked to bring together her community. However, she defined it. She brought together her neighbors uh, who often uh, happened to all be women. And we had the same five questions that we asked them that, that we then went on to ask uh, in the streets of Philadelphia and then on Zoom when the pandemic hit, then through uh, national focus groups and national polls, but always going back and saying, is this what we heard? Did, you know, And I remember the stories that they told, and I kept hearing that over and over again, is that people affordability is the biggest issue that people have. Even if we use the word certainty about affordability, because even if you if you have the means to afford the healthcare bill that you'll eventually get, the worry that you can't afford it, the uncertainty drives so many of us, um, even those with means to not get the care that we need. So overall, there's this real fear about the affordability um, of healthcare. Um, and I just remember sitting in that conversation where there was a woman who was talking about, I, you know, have MS and I have to get an MRI often. And that doctor makes me cry every time I have to get the MRI. But I, I guess I just have to keep going to it. And everybody reached across and put their hand on her hand and said, don't go back to that doctor. He makes you feel awful. Let us help you find a new doctor. They had never heard that story. You know, the woman who used a wheelchair talked about when she has to get a mammogram, and there isn't someone there that she knows and trusts to lift her up into the machine because it's high up. She had to rely on a tech who didn't handle her body in a way that felt appropriate. And so there are these just stories of feeling really alone. Um, and, and that part specifically doesn't show up in our agenda, but is what drives me to do this work is that we feel like we all are failing at healthcare when really the system is failing us. Um, when it comes to your specific question about our uh, the issues that we hear, we heard loud and clear 12 issues um, that people across demographics, political, race, ethnicity, income, zip code, say they want fixed. We published that as United Solutions for Care, and that's our agenda for change. It is truly what we heard people want, and that is what we wake up every day working on those issues. Because of that, we worked with Congress to make sure that people can afford, on Medicare, can afford their drugs. We have passed legislation in multiple states to make sure people have affordable insurance when they don't um, qualify for Medicaid or employer-sponsored coverage. Um, we see that we, you know, we saw that during the pandemic, there are states, especially states that didn't expand Medicaid, have expanded to postpartum care for women um, 12 months after birth. You know, there's so many places that we see the issues that people really want us to work on that we are able to make that progress. And that when we're able to bring the data to policymakers or to other parts of the healthcare system and say, people, these are real issues. People really want you to work on them and they're not political. It's, it's politicians bringing the political rhetoric, but these are targeted common sense reform issues that people really want us to work on to make the system work better. You, you said something a minute ago uh, that triggered something for me, just like the word certainty and yeah. thinking about Medicare in the long term, you know, yeah. for people that are, you know, my age, I'm in my mid forties, like can I be certain that Medicare will be around when it is time for me to retire? And what, like, what's the certainty level that, you know, generations younger than me should have with our, our Medicare system? 
Yeah, I think it's one of the, the toughest part about our healthcare system overall is the lack of certainty. It is the uncertainty that people feel. Um, that's especially the case when we feel like politicians on any side of the aisle are using it as a political football. Um, you know, the, you talked specifically about Medicare. We're seeing that on the news a lot recently and a little bit before about um, the solvency of Medicare. And I can take a minute to, to define that. Um, so Medicare obviously is a super important program for um, over 60 million people in this country and all of us who are waiting to use it um, if uh, as we age or if you know if we need it for other medical reasons. Um, every year, there is a group of experts that get together to look at a very specific part of Medicare, um, we call it the trust fund, to say, to look at the financial health of it. They put out a report every year, when is it going to be insolvent? Sometimes it's pretty far away and sometimes it's closer than we want to be. And in the recent um, report, they said it will be solvent until 2028, um, which is soon, but if history tells us anything uh, our government leaders come together to find bipartisan ways to push out that insolvency data. It's, um, you know, even with the the trust fund report that just came out, you know, it says that in that time we have a hundred percent of funds to cover what we think will be a hundred percent of the expenses. When that insolvency happens, it doesn't mean we have zero funds. It just means that for those specific services, and I should say that's hospital, that's hospice, it's inpatient part of Medicare, um, that you know there's a concern or their projections say we wouldn't have 100% of the funds we need to cover it. But again, Congress, this has happened before, and Congress comes together every time with a menu of options to figure out how do we make uh, the program solvent as, as we need it in the future. People should be trusting in it, right? Like it's it's not even if it's uh, got projections that are in the near term, we should trust that our government will take care of it in the long run. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, that's you know I think we all say that kind of like oh it's hard to you know trust that Congress will get together. But look at they did the omnibus at the end of the year and put in place a lot of really important bipartisan issues and. This, this, we should have the certainty that they will in this case too. Medicare is too important, um, and we all rely on it. And um, it's, it's, they've fixed, they have fixed this issue before, and they will again. And it's something that just comes up on a regular basis. So we just continue having to address it. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. group of experts gets together every year and looks at when is that insolvency date. So we're always going to get that report. We'll always have the date. It just depends on how close it is. And, you know, the longer time they have, the, the sooner they act on it, the more options they have. You never want to deal with it when it's an emergency. You have a lot less tools in your tool back then. And so starting to work on that now is really important. Can you can we get back to United States of Care and some of the initiatives or programs that you're working on? Um, what are you looking forward to or most excited about that's going on in your world this year? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one is we continue to see a path on the United Solutions for Care, our roadmap. We continue to see places where policymakers are coming together to work on these issues. We're running campaigns in multiple states where states um, across the political spectrum want to make sure people can get the insurance, that they can afford the insurance that they need. And so working with the leaders in that state, the advocates, um, the political members, we are a part of many campaigns um, to, to make sure people have that insurance. And that looks like sometimes a public option, a basic health plan, et cetera. Um, we also have kicked off work um, looking at maternal health. Um, this is obviously a crisis in our country, especially for Black women and, and women of color. And we always kick off all of our work by talking to the experts that are out there and, and, and where can we uniquely add our strengths. But more importantly, we always start by talking to people. And so we just did a focus group, uh, group bringing together 20 um, women of color to talk about their experiences in maternal health. And um, they were heartbreaking. There was one woman who 
literally wrote a note to her doctor and said, I can't die during this. I know the statistics of what happens when I, a black woman gives birth in this country and I can't die. I have a son and it's too important. And you just hear those and you think I have, we have to do something. And, and thankfully this is a space, again, there's a lot that needs to be done, but we're seeing action across the country in Congress and in states to make sure that we are addressing this really important issue. We're seeing healthcare systems and providers and startups really tackling this issue, um, you know, really centered on what do black women need because that is where our crisis is happening. And, you know, I think over 50% of the, the deaths or the issues that happen are postpartum. As a woman who's had four kids, I know the feeling of you, you're doted on in the pregnancy, focus on you to get that baby out healthy uh, and you have that baby and it is, you know, hopefully, or, you know, as healthy as it can be. And then it's all about the baby. And it's not, you know, I, I used to say, you feel like the wrapper to the candy. That is where we need to spend time is focusing on how do we get people the support they need in that postpartum phase. Um, if that's community support, if that's from loved ones, if it's doulas, there's so much, you know, Medicaid coverage during this part. Um, there's so much action to do there. And I'm, I'm really, um, it's hard to say excited to step into that space mm -hmm. because it's such a dire need. Um, but I'm really proud that the organization is going to be working on that. And then Joy, one I wanted to bring up to you is that the the things that people tell us they want in the healthcare system, certainty they can afford, you know, dependable coverage, uh, a personalized care when and how they need it, and a system that's easy to understand. No one ever says the word value based care, but none of those, especially experience and understandability. Um, and personal and full body health, none of that is possible, we know, without the tool of value-based care and what that has to promise. And so we're doing a lot of work right now, actually, to go across the country and talk to people about the concept of value-based care without using that word. Because uh, then sometimes we do use that word. And we had one woman that was like, that's not cute. Like, why would they call it that? <laughs> uh, and so, but I think it's really important to get back to, it's been it's a really important tool and it was passed, you know, over 10 years ago. And I think we've missed the roots of why this is an important tool. Sure. Ideally it saves the country money. Sure. Providers are paid in a better way, but I think the conversation has completely gotten away of why this matters to patients and the, in the system that people want. Uh, and I can tell you what doesn't really resonate with people across the country is how doctors are paid uh, or that it's saving money for the country. And honestly, a little lukewarm on if this is something that is needed for their health outcomes, because a lot of people think that their health is about them and their doctor's there to support them. But what really sells them on this idea is the experience that they want. You're not repeating your history over and over again to doctors. You have someone just around the corner who can fill your prescription and also check your foot that it was, you know, heard, but you know, that experience, um, you can text your doctor, you can do virtual care, those sort of things are really resonating with people. And I think was the national conversation about value-based care needs to come back and center on, on that. And that's the kind of research and education that we're, that we're taking on that I am really excited for. And I was so excited to tell you about it. I'm so happy to hear that. I mean, I actually have probably like a shotgun four or five questions for you. <laughs> Yeah. Just based on what, what you've just said. And, you know, one, and I'll say them before you get started and pick your order of how you yeah. want to tackle it. And one is, okay, speaking about the maternal mortality rate specific to Black women, like, is there an underlying reason that you have found as to why? Is it generally because we're just not listening to them? Or is there something more systemic going on? Because being able to vocalize the issue and not being able to address it when we all know that it's an issue is confusing to me. So there's one. Mm -hmm. Two, um, have you guys figured out how to, like, I know in terms of value-based care, you know, being able to measure the cost of preventing something versus mm -hmm. the cost of what actually happens. I know that that's a diff, that's kind of tricky language, but it it's involved around like, how do we actually address, you know, a lot of the issues before they become bigger issues. Like prevention is obviously better than 
reaction. And then thirdly, so I'm again, like pick your order. <laughs> um, it had to do with community care and also paying people to care. Like, I know we're not talking about reimbursement, but like, it just seems like ultimately what we're seeking for in our healthcare is to be cared for, like actually innately cared for, not mm -hmm. just, you know, bandaging a wound type of deal. And I don't know that that can be built into the system. Like, I don't know that you can actually quote unquote, pay somebody to care, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, those are all good. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a lot, but if you can tackle, you know, any of those three issues, <laughs> go ahead, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll start with your last one. I think there is a movement to get care into the community. And when I hear you say that, I hear care, not just from loved ones, but care in the community. When we talk to people, that resonates so widely. They want to, to have somebody that maybe they go to church with or that they... Um, that they've known their whole life growing up or somebody that looks like them and speaks their language. They That is the kind of care that feels like it will satisfy their their you know their whole their whole needs and their whole body um and i think there's a real movement in healthcare to do that i think you know we see a lot of um for profit companies and and others where they're bringing care into the home they are hiring you know city block with training and hiring community healthcare workers you know of course that's not the only one hospitals that are moving stuff outside of their walls they need to do more of that and bring it into the community um i think you know the data is showing us that 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 is the way, you know, how we pay them, I think, again, is goods to value-based care, but how, um, I think it's a really important of the future of healthcare, and it's also what people want. I will, what, when you said that, it was something else that sparked for me is um, when we tested the United Solutions for Care has these 12 different issues that we heard from people, um, and they're the ones that rank the highest, and the one that ranked the highest with Republicans were always looking for places where, across demographics, where do people spike the most? Um, this was popular across the board, but it was really high with Republicans is caring for loved ones who ca caring, providing support for people who care for loved ones or family members at home. There are so many people, and we saw that come to a head in the pandemic, who are caring for someone in their family in their house, and the financial burden, the emotional burden, the the um just burnout that people have. You know, Alex Drain at Archangels is looking at that caregiver intensity index and helping people understand why they're burned out is because they're caring for another one, another human. And when we talk to people, there there's a need for supporting them financially, but it's actually not what when people talk about it, it's not what they say. They don't say they need the financial resources as much as the reprieve. They want to go have another job where they can get out of the house or go on a vacation and they, but they feel like they can't leave this this loved one or they can't trust that someone's going to come in and care for them for 24 hours or 48 hours um you know when we think that and it bleeds into so much when we think about maternal health you know is somebody coming and caring are you caring for your you know your spouse the woman who had the baby in the house and the and the baby and and it's really this kind of wrap around. I think it's a, a a new way of thinking about caregiving that we aren't talking about as much in this country, but is a really burning issue. So that that's one of your questions. <laughs> okay, wait, before you go to the next one, that sparked yeah. something for me because I have a sister and a niece who are both caregivers and know just from their experience, like we don't really pay them very well. Like it's a very important job. And yet it is real. Like a lot of times it's paid for privately through how like households who need the extra support. And of course, if it's not covered, like they just, they are kind of stuck trying to navigate the systems on behalf of the person that they're caring for. And holy cow, it is, it's, yeah. it, it's a lot of work and when, I, when they tell me about what they do and then also about what they get paid for it. I'm just like, well, that's broken. Like, <laughs> right. And, and I, and I don't know them of course, but there may be a feeling that they want to care for this person or that they don't think anyone else can care for them. 
Um, and so you are like stuck in that place. And I don't even, sometimes people feel stuck. Sometimes they don't. It's hard language to use because yeah. it's a nuanced position to be in. Um, but it is so much work and, you know, the, you know, the, the archangels is really thinking about how do you help people understand their caregiving index and how do you then connect them to resources to help with that? Something that is underlying and what you just said, and also a lot of conversations I have with people, and especially in that first one in San Diego is that I wish we had, a, they called it a healthcare buddy. I wish I had somebody who could help me navigate this healthcare system. And I don't mean an enrollment navigator, like navigate this healthcare system uh -huh. or come with me to a doctor's appointment when I've just been told I have cancer and I can't remember anything this doctor said. I'm not asking the follow-up questions I want. Can I have someone there to help me? In a way, it's like, oh my God, what is this healthcare system where we need to build a new capability of a buddy? Um, but, but it's but that complicated. And especially if you're at one of your most vulnerable times, right? Like imagine you just got the worst news and you're not thinking straight, possibly in shock, like it would be important to have an advocate or a buddy system of somebody who could, you know, work on your behalf or, you know, ask questions on your behalf. I, I see that. I've never yeah. even heard of this caregiver index. So I'm interested oh. to know more about it. Too. Oh gosh. Do you know Alex? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> you're ready. The forest, okay. all forces <laughs> We'll introduce you. Uh, she's amazing. Okay. Can, do you want to tackle either one of those other two questions? If you even remember what I asked, one of them was about, okay, um, I think the maternal um, more mortality rate yeah. among black women, there's one. And then the other one was just prevention versus reaction. You know, I know we're getting back into the cost conversation of just like, how do you we have the data on the cost of that? If that's what you want to yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's tough to measure. And you're like, if that's the direction that we want to go in, it's really hard. It's a difficult thing to track of how much money you're saving. Yeah. Yeah. So, that one I don't have, I don't, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, I haven't met anybody who's been able to, to figure it out. And it seems like, okay, well, that seems to be where we want to head. Like, okay, making the case that prevention is better than reaction However, there's not a system, we don't, our system isn't built like that. You can't say I saved you a dollar because you didn't need care. You're healthy today. Okay. Well, I do have something that is interesting on this. So one of the things that happened with the Affordable Care Act was we as a country decided that people should have preventive services and screenings at no cost. Uh, that was to make sure that we could you know, screen for cancer, to screen for issues like preeclampsia after birth, um, you know, smoking cessation, and et cetera, and a lot of cancer screenings. Um, right now, there's a court case that I don't think a lot of people know about that we're really focused on and doing a lot of work on in Texas. It's called Braidwood Management versus Becerra, where there is a real risk that, depending on this judge's ruling, that all of those preventive services will be taken away, that people will have to pay out of pocket for these preventive services. Um, the, that is going through a Texas court right now where it was brought up and um, we're kind of waiting for this, this last stage to understand from the judge's point of view how widespread this is. They, they believe that this um, unconstitutional moment how how this should how this will impact the country but I don't think a lot of people are paying attention to this and if you get to the idea of like what kind of money has the country saved let alone lives that have been saved from prevention I think looking at data before the Affordable Care Act when we were people weren't getting the preventive screenings um and the data since then, then God forbid, if we have another moment where people have to pay out of pocket for these screenings, um, not only are we going to lose people's lives or years off of their life, um, but I think we'll also see the cost um, implications of the uh, lack of ability of, of prevention. Okay, so fingers crossed that that goes so that we can still cover those. I'll definitely be tracking that. That was not on my radar. There's okay. And then 
and we should be wrapping up soon, but it's just like, I, I feel like I have this pleasure of having this brilliant mind in front of me. So <laughs> forgive me for forgive me for wanting to talk to you more, but I guess let, I'll, let me finish by just asking you, what gives you hope? What are the things? Cause there's a lot of scary stuff that's going on in the world. There's rights being taken away from people. It is hard to navigate. You know, there's a lot of challenges and I, um, I'd like to, you know, leave our listeners and audience with something to be hopeful about. So what, what is giving you hope right now? What's giving me hope is that we did something that I think a lot of people would say is not possible, which is finding agreement among demographics, especially political, especially in healthcare. Um, what's giving me hope is that with this roadmap, we are making progress. Last year, we had South Dakota residents voted to expand Medicaid. We had a bipartisan agreement in Congress to make sure that people had the insurance, affordable insurance that they needed. We saw the first time in decades progress on reducing the cost of prescription drugs for Medicare beneficiaries and for this country. Um, we are actively passing legislation in states so more people have affordable insurance everywhere you go and we need to keep up the drumbeat but people are talking about how horrendous this maternal health crisis especially for black women is um i think we're at a real tipping point of putting people at the center of healthcare again it's really hard to say when you know women's rights are being taken away but the incremental changes to make the healthcare system better is happening. And I think we're just at the precipice of a lot more of that happening where people are gonna be demanding more changes and, and really making sure that the healthcare system works, works better for them. Well, Natalie, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> and for- yeah, if people wanna follow you, connect with you, get in touch with your, your, or just like understand your work better, where would you point them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our social is United States of Care. Um, we're on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. Our, our website, you can sign up for our um, twice a month newsletter, uh, but we're always interested. A lot of the work that we do is working with people in the private sector to understand what's working or not and use that to shape better policy. And so I know your listeners are out there tackling the hardest problems, so we'd love to engage. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.